if God is, is all powerful, all loving, all knowing, why is there evil? Why do people suffer? Okay, very good question. If God's all powerful, all loving, and all knowing, then why is there so much evil? Ultimately, I do not know. Jesus never directly answered the question. For thousands of years, philosophers a lot more intelligent than I have have struggled through that question. They've not have come up with an ultimate answer, and I'm not naive enough to think that I will be able to answer you. I can't, ultimately. But, as a Christian, I have to think. First problem. My atheist friend, what is evil? Doesn't exist. No objective morality. Bingo. Exactly. You see, my atheist friend, if you use evil to dismiss God, you're contradicting yourself. Because if there is no God, there's no such thing as evil or good. But by arguing for the existence of God, you argue for a sense of morality. You argue that evil does exist. Exactly. The atheist doesn't make such a claim. Correct. But if the atheist is so bummed out about evil, my question is, what are you so bummed out about? It makes you what, feel bad. What is, is. What is, is. And you never get ought from is. It just is. And then for you to tell me, oh, it not, it should not, or it ought not to happen. The argument is that if God exists, there should not be so much evil. The atheist doesn't make the claim that there should not be evil, period. The Christian is the one who makes the claim that there is an objective sense of morality, yep. but the existence of evil contradicts this, this assertion. Okay, good. Maybe it's not too obvious, but what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to go right to the heart of the atheist and say, you know that evil is real. And guess what? The only way it can be real is if there is some type of God. I cannot subscribe to Christianity in good conscience while acknowledging that evil exists. Yeah, but don't you see so many of the words you use? Good conscience. I can't subscribe to Christianity in good conscience if evil exists. What is conscience? I'm a phenomenalist. I don't believe consciousness exists. I believe we're just hormones and electrical signals, signals running through the brain. I don't believe any of that. Good. Then if that's true, and I haul back and smack him in the face, that's just my electromagnetic reactions going off in my head. And so I had to hit him in the face because that's Absolutely. the way I'm programmed by my chemicals. Absolutely. I'm a determinist, too. Okay. I, think, I think that we shouldn't do that because I think that humans are productive, you know, organisms that can build things, that can improve quality of life. Right. Right. And so I don't argue for morality. I argue that that doesn't mean that we shouldn't punish people who do bad things. That doesn't mean that there are not wrong doings in the world. But where do you get off punishing me if my elect... Electrical reactions make me hit him. Oh, I absolutely agree. I believe the criminal Why would justice you punish me? I, I believe, I, I use the word punishment in a sort of colloquial sense. I believe the criminal justice system is completely flawed and that it, it uh, gives you responsibility for your actions. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that the criminal justice system should be focused on rehabilitation, not punishment. I'm asking you questions about how the problem of evil jives with your worldview. You bet. And Very fair. And you gave a very respectable answer. You don't have a good answer, and that's perfectly fine. If you can subscribe to a worldview with such a major problem that you don't have an answer to, by all means, your personal experience has led you to that. But I can't do that. It's not convincing to me. I know. And I predicted that's exactly where you would go. That's why I bent over backwards on my first point to show you your abhorrence over evil shows me you can't be a consistent relativist because you are too wedded to the existence of evil. And you see, so what I'm obviously first trying to do is, I'm trying to drive a wedge between what you feel and what you believe, your intellect and your emotions. And I'm see, saying- I'm an epiphenomenalist. I don't believe that what I feel is real. I don't believe that consciousness is anything more than just, you know, the sound of the whistle from the engine. It's not anything more than that. Okay, but sir, I don't think you can live that out. I can. I do. Okay. How on earth do you live that out? It's when it comes to a relationship it's, with it, a man, a woman, a parent? A, you know. It's the same way we use the words night and day to describe the rotation of the earth. Night and day are not objectively true concepts. There's no, the universe doesn't care about night and day. We use those words as shortcuts because they're useful and practical. So that doesn't mean night and day are real things. I believe the same thing about consciousness. I believe it's a pragmatism. 
If then the why, are, speaking, why are you using human language with me right now? If night and day do not mean anything, why are you using human language with me now? Language doesn't mean anything, does it? It doesn't. It's just sound waves. But it's a way sound that waves, we, exactly. It's a way we can convey information. I don't think that I don't think that's contradictory to my worldview. There is no there is no objective reason that the visible spectrum of light that we can observe has to be that range. The only thing that matters, evolutionary speaking, is that we could see the color green. But everything to the left and right of that is completely irrelevant. You know, there are there's animals in the animal kingdom that have dozens of, of visual cones that we don't have. Yeah. There's no reason that we have to see the colors that we do. Yeah. But we do, and that's why art is beautiful to us because it appeals to those certain colors but objectively those colors that that arrangement of paint means nothing okay here's how i disagree i think the physical is real i think science is good science can answer the question if i drop strychnine into my grandma's tea will it kill her and the scientific answer is yes if you put strychnine in your grandma's tea it'll kill her but the next question should I put strychnine? Ought I to put strychnine in my grandma's tea? Why? Because I want her money. Should I do that or not? Science cannot answer that question. Science can answer that. Science does explain where, where uh, inclusive altruism comes from. Take an animal behavior course, you'll understand it better. There's an evolutionary basis for altruism. Yeah, what is it? It's the, the gay uncle effect, right? Why, why would it be, po how could it possibly be advantageous for, for a homosexual organism to exist. It's because when an organism is homosexual, it increases the fitness of its relatives, and those relatives share genes with it. Therefore, having a gene that makes someone queer is actually beneficial to the overall fitness of their lineage. Therefore, you can extrapolate this into altruism. It's beneficial to not kill your grandmother because this breaks down the family dynamic, and therefore makes it more difficult for your genes to be passed on. How many divorces do there have to be before you realize it's beneficial to divorce? It's beneficial to be married. Divorce is it's beneficial for me to steal. If I need money and I don't not, have enough, it's, it's beneficial, beneficial for me to steal. steal. It's not beneficial for and me to steal. And also, by the way, just in case you're wondering, rape can be beneficial for the I'm, continuation of the human race. You know, so if your whole basis of morality is what's beneficial for the evolutionary cycle to continue, it's not hard. You don't have to be too intelligent to justify just about anything you want to. Cliff, do you know how small a fraction of the animal kingdom is monogamous and does not participate in rape? Yeah, humans, exactly. Humans have existed for if the blink of an rape, eye. If primates their people, they're, they're animals of different genders, why don't we rape? Humans have existed for the blink of an eye on the evolutionary time scale. Yeah. To, say that, to say that our morality, our, our behavior is, is the ultimate, is the ultimate like, end point of, yes. of morality, of evolution, is just completely naive and self-centered of you. You completely ignore the entire animal kingdom where these these morals they don't exist where really? it is just survival do you step on roaches or ants yeah why don't you step on a baby because it's a human and i'm programmed with altruism like you're programmed you don't have a free will i don't believe in free will i already told you i'm a determinist you're a determinist right absolutely well then when she says she loves you you understand she doesn't really love you i understand freely. there's chemicals in my brain that make me act a, just a chemical way. thing i understand right? that if, we, if i took an electric probe and i shocked the right part of your brain i could make you fall in love with a lamppost no you couldn't yes you could you don't know that i do know that no you do not you do not know what will necessarily happen if you shock me with an electric probe you, you are completely invalidating the entire field of neuroscience and if you're going to do that no, there's not. no point in having this conversation no, no, he's not. no i'm not not even close it's totally false. There, uh, there's these rats. Incredible right? generalization you just made there, sir. There, it's totally there, erroneous. There are these rats that display an abnormal amount of maternal care for a rodent species. Rodents yeah. in general, they sort of leave their young to just, you know, fend for themselves. But this specific species is known for giving uh, a disproportionate amount of maternal care. Yeah. You could call that love, right? No. I've never had a good discussion with a rat. I don't have the faintest idea whether a rat can love or not. Oh, their studies good well i've had lots of i've bred golden retrievers with my wife we've had horses we got a lot of mice in our house Sorry, i've never had a good point. conversation me, with any of them my point. These and rats. for me to insist that an animal can love i disagree with your definition of love i am convinced that i don't have to love him i don't have to love my children i can be a deadbeat dad i can hate him absolutely or i can choose to love him it's up to me and Let guess me. what I'm so convinced of that, that I'm going to hold him responsible for whether he loves her or hates her. Let me finish the point I was trying to make. Let Go me ahead. finish the point I was trying to make. Mm -hmm. What you call love, if we take a sample of the brain tissue, we yes. see increased levels of oxytocin. 
what do you think happens to someone who is missing their oxytocin receptors? What do you think happens to someone who can't produce oxytocin? Do you think they are still capable of love? Yes. Studies we have yes. suggest that they aren't. The they studies are we have still suggest that they to are a lesser extent. To a lesser extent. Are. So a le it thank is, you. So the love, extent. the love is rooted in the physical. You admit that. <laughs> of it's, course, the body is real. Of course, if you would do a lobotomy on me, you're going to change my behavior. Exactly. That's obvious. But the point is, when you've given me the chemical analysis of my brain, you've not said everything there is about me. I disagree. I totally disagree I, with I you. I think if we could simulate a human brain, neuron for neuron, molecule for molecule, that would be identical to you. It's called I think a it robot. indiscernible. Is and there a difference between a robot and you? No, I don't think so. If it's I a sophisticated disagree. enough robot, see, that's where we disagree. You believe in the soul. You believe there's something more to us in the physical. That's right. I don't. I've seen nothing compelling enough to suggest me that there is. Right. But you've argued about evil out here. I've argued that if you argue God exists, evil must exist, and if evil exists, it contradicts the idea of God. I have not argued for the objective existence of evil. You've lived your life as if evil is real. Pragmatically. People, what do you mean pe pragmatically? People make me feel bad, and so it's easy to label them as evil. It's a pragmatism, but objectively, that's not true. Objectively, when I form my worldview, I can't incorporate that into my worldview. So in spite of what you know, you're living in fantasy land. I'm not living fantasy yes, land. Yes, you are. I'm living practically. You say, I know that there's no such thing as evil. I know there's no such thing as love. But pragmatically, I'm going to live as if evil is real and as if love is real. You're Absolutely. living in fantasy when land. Someone cuts me you're off taking the drug. You're taking the cool When someone cuts me off when I'm driving, I get mad at them. But in such I know they probably got somewhere to be. Maybe, maybe their kid was just born in the hospital. I'm sure there is a reason why they did that. That doesn't stop me from getting angry in the moment. You know why? Because I don't have free will. I can't control my emotions. I can't control what I feel. You can't control your emotions. No one can. You're, you're you can't be patient or impatient. No. You can't love or hate. You, you can't, can't choose to forgive you or to seek revenge. Or reaction. You can't Are you kidding me? You, can't you cannot control your immediate reaction. Oh, I promise you, you can. If someone punches you in the face, you're, you're going to control yourself and not get angry, at least for a split second. No, that's not. If I experience the emotion of anger, there's nothing wrong with that. So the question is, do I have a free will to handle my anger or not? That's not what I'm saying. I'm oh, saying, that's what I am saying, obviously. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that your snap reaction, that initial emotional response, is not something under your control. I'm saying it is. No. What I do with it, what I do with it, is my decision. That's not, I'm not talking about what you do with it. I'm talking about your... Well, that's what I mean when I say free will. I, I'm I know that I understand that my emotions. sex drive I don't have any control over in the sense that I have a sex drive, okay? I don't control whether I do or don't. I understand that I get angry and I don't control whether I that's do or don't. That's the point I'm trying to make. We're, we're saying the question the is, thing. what do you do with that anger? What do you do with that sex drive? And my argument is you have a free will and therefore you are responsible for what you do with your anger, whether you murder or forgive, what you do with your sex drive, so, whether you, you rape saying? or respect a woman or a man and don't rape them. So I, I guess in response to my original original question, the problem yes. of evil, are you saying that free will is the source of evil? Well, by gollies, I'm glad we got back there. You're absolutely correct. You are perceptive. All-powerful God chooses to partially limit his power by giving us a free will. Therefore, if I haul back and smack him and turn to you and say, oh, God made me do it, I'm a liar, I'm a con artist. God's all powerful, but he limited his power by giving me a free will. Is that really a free choice is the, is the alternative is eternal damnation? If I say, give me your shoes, I'll shoot your toes off. Is that really a free choice? You sure it is. Many people sacrifice their lives. I it's a free disagree. choice. I don't think that's a free choice. I think I think threatening someone with eternal damnation unless they subscribe to your sense of morality is not a free choice. Really? I then you're a slave here at UT. Because UT has told you that if you flunk, 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 they will kick you out, out, out of this university. That is not manipulation. That is saying there are consequences to your behavior. And if you don't study, and if you flunk, 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 you will flunk out of this place. And for you to look back at the University of Texas and say, oh, that's just raw manipulation. You're threatening to expel me. So therefore, that's how you're motivating me to study. That is so intellectually dishonest, it's scary. I completely agree. I think capitalism removes that choice from people if you want to argue that there's free will. I think that the, the idea that you need to get a degree, that you need to make money in order to survive, it, it takes away people's choice. I completely I agree. Different. Is there is there free will in heaven? Yes. So I, I can choose to rape and murder and steal in heaven? Yep. doesn't sound like heaven to me. It just sounds like here, one more step. Well, in heaven, you're not going to have any desire to rape and steal. So you're Because in heaven, you want to live with God, not separate from God. So you're saying that God is capable of creating humans that have free will but are unwilling and do not have the desire to perform evil. So why is that not everyone on earth? We're born broken. 
because mom and dad rebelled against God, Adam and Eve rebelled against God, were born broken, as Eugene O'Neill put it. So all Life is about healing, so the whole, grace of God is the glue. This whole skyscraper of free will is built on the foundation of, of original sin. No, not at all. That's not what I said. Free will comes from the fact we're creating the image of God. God is a free being with a will. God creates you and me in his image, which means we are created to reflect God's character. Yes, but you said that we have free will in heaven, but no one desires to act out in evil. That's so right. So it's possible to create a being that has free will, but no desire to form evil. So why does not God populate the earth with said being? Because then you don't have a free will. So you don't have free will in heaven. Yes, you do. Because you want to obey God. Is anyone else hearing this? <laughs> Good talking to you, Cliff. It's very great talking to you. Great I love to it when talk you come on campus. You. Take care, man. How, what exactly is the connection between those locations and the archaeological evidence that Jesus rose from the dead? No I mean, archaeological evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. The archaeological evidence is that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are historically reliable documents. That was my point. Because they said the locations of areas that we know exist. Sure, because I mean, document, every, every major religious text does that as well. No, I mean, look at the Quran. It says locations that can be archaeologically sound. It talks about Mecca and Medina. Yes, so why is the Bible any better? Why is the Bible, or your interpretation of the Bible, because you don't specify what sect you're part of, but I would contest that there'd be a great many Christians that would disagree on your specific nitty-gritty point. That's just the nature of a religion. I mean, there's several billion people part of Christianity. You're not going to agree with all the various nits. So what's your point? My point is, why specifically is your interpretation the one you should be listening to? You shouldn't. You should not take my interpretation. You should be intellectually open-minded and honest enough to get the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and read them for yourself. Do not take it from me. Read them for yourself, and if you as a history major here at UT have a question about are these documents historically reliable, then Jacob, you've got to do something that I don't think you've done yet, at least you're not, you haven't told me, because I've asked you repeatedly this question. How do you determine whether any document is historically reliable? I do it by four tests. I hope you have some tests as a history major that you use on any document to determine whether the document is historically reliable or not. So what are your tests, Jacob? Borderline tests? Well, yeah. first, you know, you have to read the historical document. You have to cross-examine it with other various historical documents written around the same time. Look at it from the modern evidence that can be deduced from it today, as I was talking about before, archaeology, etc. And of course, no one individual can deduce whether or not a major historical text is accurate on their own. In fact, I don't think we've been able to do that with the vast majority of historical texts, but I think the closest we can do is look at the various other experts in these fields, cross-examine, and come up with the best solution. Simply put, I think it is naive at the very least to say from a certainty that this document, that this source is correct. Like you said, you said to us that don't take my word of the gospel and whatnot is correct. Learn about it yourselves. And I think that that is a very good way of looking at things. And I, I compel everyone who is listening to this to do this as well. Look at the gospels, buy them, and read them. But don't just do it with the gospels. Look at it with a variety of sources, a variety of different perspectives. Buy the Quran. Look at the Holy Vedas. Look yes. at look at the great manner of religious historical text to come up with your own opinions. And once you do, once you read it, then well. So what is your conclusion? After reading the Gospels, what have you concluded about Jesus Christ? I haven't read the Gospels, so Why I Why not? Well, truth, truth be told, it's not really the area of history that I'm particularly interested in, and I do find the writings rather dull. Truth be told, I would much rather read the Holy Vedas or the works of Confucius, but... Why? Well, because they're in areas I find a lot more interesting, a lot more philosophically um, round and interesting in my point of view. It's not really a matter of morality or whatnot. I just haven't really gotten to it. Come on, Jacob. You and I are both going to die one day. Sure. Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead, supposedly. So don't you think you owe it to yourself as a thinking history major here at UT to study the Gospels and ask yourself, does the historical evidence point to Christ rising or does it not? Sure. What's more important than that, Jacob? 
Well, I'd say it's just about as important as reading every other major religious text. Have you no. read the Quran? Yes, I've read the Quran. Have you read the Holy Vedas? Yes, I've read some of the Vedas. Yes, I've read the teachings of Siddhartha. Have you read Siddhartha every Siddhartha single religious, various religious No, I've not read every single religious text. Okay. So don't you feel that you owe it to yourself to study the various in-depth oral histories of the various tribal religions of the deep Amazon? Maybe that's just as spiritually valuable to you as reading the Holy Gospel. Good. And I can promise you, Jacob, if you've read the writings that are found in the deep Amazon jungle down in South America, and if you say, Cliff, this is truth, I'm going to ask, please tell me, Jacob, why have you concluded that those writings from the Amazon jungle in South America speak the truth? The same way I hope you'd ask me, Cliff, why have you thought that the evidence of the Gospels points to Jesus Christ being the truth? That's to be open-minded, right? Sure. Okay. So once again, why have you chosen not to read the Gospels carefully in light of the fact that you are at a university in a nation where the Judeo-Christian ethic has been the overriding ethic? Because I have chosen to prioritize studying and reading other religious texts simply do out of personal interest, but how about this? What's your name? Cliff. I'll make a deal with you, Cliff. Yep. I'll read the gospel. Yep. If you, in turn, yep. spend some time and effort going to the deepest, darkest corners of, well, just historical records in general of oral testament and deeply in-depth studying the oral traditions of the various Amazonian tribes. You've got to be kidding me. You just asked, you just asked me, come on, Cliff, let's make a deal. You're going to read the Gospels, and you want me to go to the Amazon jungle in South America and no, check no, no, out no, no. those... No, no, no. I okay, what do you want me to read? I want you to read the various online or in paper accounts of these oral texts and records. Which ones? Mix... Good question. I'll let You're you the one who put it forward. I'll let you pick and choose. Which one do you like that you want me to read? Truth be told, I don't think either of us have read the various oral texts of the Amazon. I specifically chose that example due to the obscurity of them in mind. But the point of that is that there isn't in anything inherently more or less legitimate about those various Amazonian sources. I don't know much about the gospel, as I'm sure you might have deduced, at least about the specific natures of it. Yeah. You've given me a title, and that's right. a pretty good title. Where on earth are you coming from in here when you play some of the type of intellectual games you've been playing with me? You've challenged me, which is legit, to study these different religions from the Amazon. Fair enough. Good. But when I ask you, which one do you want me to study, and you say, well, to tell you the truth, I don't know, and I really haven't studied them myself, what on earth are you doing to me? You're just jerking me around, man. What I'm trying to do is simply what you're trying to do to me, get you to explore various cultures and ideas that you may not have been exposed to. No, if you don't want to go it's to not what I've done. I've asked you to read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with an open mind, and to ask yourself, does the historical evidence of the way Jesus lived, taught, died, and rose from the dead point to him being a quack if it does reject him? Or does it point to him being so reliable that it would be most wise for you to put your faith in him? Okay. That's what I've asked you to do. So, Cliff, if I come back the other day with a title of a various ethnic group in the Amazon with their various... That you've read and are impressed with. Mm -hmm. Yes. And tell you to read it. Yeah. Would you, in turn, spend a large amount of time studying and reading them? If I, in turn, spend a lot of time studying and reading the gospel? Sure. Absolutely. Well, great. I can promise you when Muslims confront me with how Muhammad is reliable, I read the Quran. I don't read the Bible to find out about Muhammad. I read the Quran. And when a Buddhist challenges me, I don't read the Bible, I read the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. And when a Hindu challenges me, I don't read the Bible, I read the Vedas and Upanishads. And I find out about Krishna, and learn about karma and reincarnation. That's what it means to respect someone, to take what they say seriously. And so, yes sir, if you come back here this week, I'll be here every day this week, Jacob, would hope you could come back. And if you come up to me with a document, that say, and you say, Cliff, I've read this, it seems to be that this is true, I'll read as much as I can. We'll sit right over there on that table afterwards, and then you read the gospel, and I'll read that document, and we'll talk about why we think what we think. You have a big deal. All right, man. Good. I'll look forward to seeing you later this week, Jacob. I understand that the point is to ask you questions and hear your answers. No. People make statements out here, and I ask them to back them up. So you're not just here to listen to me speak or Stuart speak. You just said people come here to ask questions. Yeah, to answer questions. dialogue then. And a back di and forth. Exactly, a dialogue. Yeah, dialogue. Yeah. I don't know. Well, what don't you know? 
What's not real clear? What are we hiding? I'm just saying it feels very one-sided. All right. Uh, okay, fair enough. So what do you think about God? Um, what, do, what do I think about God? Can you be a bit more specific? What do you think about Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ, um, real guy, he existed, that's about it. Okay, why do you believe that? He's dead. Why do you believe he was a real guy who really existed? Why do you not believe he's just a fictitious person that people made up? Well, because there's historical records that state that Jesus Christ existed. While those could have been simply more Christian doctrine, like, there was a profound effect that this one man had on history, and he did exist. I just don't think he's, you know, all that Christian say he is. Okay, fine. So, what do you think about him, and what's the evidence, whatever you think about him is true? What I think about him is true. What do you think about Christ? Who is he? And yeah. second question, why have you concluded that? What's your evidence to support whatever you think about him? Well, there's another point. I haven't exactly thought about this question before the moment I walked up here. Oh, really? Yeah, and you've been out here the entire time. You've talked with all of us, and so it, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right for me to be even talking about this right now. Well, then why did you start? Well, because I was just helping my friend out. I was trying to explain his point of view, and then you asked a question, and I thought, thought to answer it. All right. But you did say you think Jesus was an historical person. He was a historical person, yeah. Why do you God. think that? Like What's I your think? evidence that Jesus was a real historical person? Okay, fine. Well, you got me there. I guess there isn't evidence that Jesus existed, but I guess there isn't really existence that somebody with my name and my identity existed other than my birth certificate and my, you know, government records. Sir, do you accept anything from history? Or is history I a blank? History is very subjective. Yeah, it's subjective. Can you know anything about what happened in the United States or not? If I were to tell you that slavery never existed in the United States, what would you say to me? I'd say you're wrong. Why would you say that I'm wrong? If I genuinely have never seen a slave here in the United States, why would you have the audacity to tell me that I'm wrong because well, I think slavery never existed here in the United States? Well, there's also just not proof that the world wasn't, you know, invented last Thursday. And by all rights, it's possible that last Thursday, the world and all of us and all of our memories just snapped into existence. Yeah, why don't you believe that? Why do you believe that last Thursday actually ex happened? Why do you trust your memory? I don't trust my memory. My memory is very faulty. Everyone did. You trust it to some extent, don't you? Sure you do. I can. I can yeah. choose to. I am convinced that slavery was a part of the United States history. It's a tragedy because the historical eyewitness testimony is slavery really happened. Thank you for joining us for these few minutes. We'd like to personally invite you Sunday mornings to St. Paul's Episcopal Church located in Darien at 9 a.m. or to Grace Farms at 10 a.m. in New Canaan, Connecticut. Check us out more online at www.gracecommunity.info to learn more.